and deletions for the agenda. Do we have any today? Staff has, staff has one change this evening to the agenda. Item 9C uh, has been pulled from the agenda. Staff has notified individuals who reached out to the city with public comment, as well as updated the website and our agenda mailing list. Great, thank you. That'll take us to item three for presentations. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Um, it, I get the privilege to introduce to you um, Casey Anderson, who is Recreation's new coordinator and will oversee um, classes, promotions, and the community center. Casey is from Chico and where she graduated from in June of 2022 with a double major in politics and legal studies. At 15 years old, Casey earned an American Red Cross lifeguard certification and began working at a local swimming pool in Chico during high school. After moving to Santa Cruz, Casey was employed by County Parks at the Simpkins Family Swim Center as head lifeguard where she worked until joining the city. During her time with the county, Casey realized how much she enjoyed providing individuals with recreational opportunities and is excited to be part of the Capitola Recreation Team. Council, additionally, I would like to comment that the recent storms has given Casey the opportunity to shine. During Casey's time with the county, she worked as a CZU shelter worker and has been a huge asset to the city as we opened the shelter 
as, a, as we change the community center into a shelter. Um, as we have been quickly responding to the dynamic work created by the storm, she has proven resourceful and dedicated to service. Recreation is happy to have her as part of our team, and we look forward to what Casey will contribute to the city. And so I present to you Casey Anderson. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Um, first off, I want to say thank you to Nikki um, for introducing me and also just being a great support system as I have started my role the past couple of months. Also, um, I just wanted to say I'm really excited to see where this role takes me. Um, the past couple of weeks has really shown me how much of a team the city of Capitola is, and I'm really excited to continue on um, in the future. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Casey. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome, Casey. Thank you. Yeah, and what a time for you to start. <laughs> we, we appreciate your efforts and uh, no time like the present. We'll thank need you. you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> All right. And then do we have a report on closed session? Good evening, Mayor and Council members and Capital One community. A closed session was had on the item on the agenda and direction was given to staff. On the items on the agenda, there were three closed sessions and direction was given to staff. Thank you. Awesome, thanks. And also, staff, do we have any additional materials? Great. So we will move to oral communications. Um, this is by members of the public. So these, um, any of these communications are um, to address the city council on any consent items on tonight's agenda or any topic um, that is not on our general government section. Hi, Mayor Council, and may please, uh, excuse me, Mayor Kaiser, may please the council. My name is Stephen Woodside. I just came off um, shoveling sand into sandbags along the river where I spent most of my life and uh, just want to thank the staff, uh, the entire Capitola staff for doing such an outstanding job during the recent uh, floods. We're not over it yet, but um, I just wanted to come and express my gratitude to all of you. Thanks. Well, thank you. Is there anybody else in the public? or out there on the interwebs? Nobody has their hand raised. Great. All right, we can go to staff and city council comments. Any comments? Staff, you have, yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, first, I just want to do a little bit of a brief explanation about why I'm holding a portable mic right now. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't actually a game show. Uh, <laughs> with the recent uh, weather that we had, we had multiple power surges through City Hall, and unfortunately it uh, cooked a couple of these guys. So for the time being, we're having to make do with a, a portable mic, and then I'll be share sharing it with the city clerk, which I'll get into the uh, appointments later on this evening. And then secondarily, we'll be talking more about the storm, so I will give you more of an update on are with uh, our emergency planning in a second. Thanks. I have a quick comment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just want to, again, thank staff for all their hard work over the last uh, week or so since the storms and all of the community uh, members who have wanted to volunteer and provide donations and have reached out to find out how the, they can be a part of the recovery here in our town. Um, I had a, uh, I also want to thank the Community Foundation for their work in managing the financial donations. I met last night with the steering committee that's looking at how these financial donations will be distributed to our community members and our businesses. Um, and as of last night, there was an initial uh, commitment of $100,000 to come into our city, the first round of which will be for grants for food service businesses specifically. And I think that those were some of the hardest hit in our village. 
Um, there will be uh, some steering committee members uh, in the village, hopefully tomorrow, but definitely very soon uh, for business owners to get information about how they can apply for this, this funding. Um, and if anyone has any questions or doesn't see a business representative or isn't reached out to, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and I would be happy to connect you with the right person. Great, that's awesome information. And um, yeah, just going off that, um, we had a pretty interesting visit on, what day was that? Wednesday? Um, of the, or Tuesday of the governor and that was um, really, really cool to have the support not only from our local people but from the higher ups and again just want to echo what Kristen said too just it's been um, it's been really amazing to work with such amazing staff members that we have in the city and our community members as well so for all of you people that have stepped up thank you so much so we can go to consent items <clears throat> the consent items um, are enacted by one motion um, in the form listed below so no separate discussion. Um, if any council member wants to pull a consent item or make a motion. I so move um, consent items 8A, <coughs> B, and C. I'll second. Great. We have a motion and a second. May we please have a roll call? Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Aye. Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser? Aye. That passes unanimously. We'll move on to 9, which is general government. Um, we have 9A, which is our staff update on the winter storm event. Our act recommended action here today is to receive the update. And, oh, from staff regarding the winter storm. Great. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Give me a second. All right. What if you end the slideshow and start over? Hmm. We can still see it this way, though, too. I mean, we yeah. could. It's supposed to run for all of these, though, the problem. We are in business, people. Wow. <laughs> After all these years, you think you know how to share a screen, but <laughs> new challenges. Okay, Alexander, how does that look on Zoom for you? Um, it doesn't look great. <laughs> I can see the. <laughs> 
it just doesn't look full screen, but it, it did earlier, like, right? Because um, I'm seeing the, the slide and some, um, some buttons and then the next slide in the corner. Uh, but at, at a couple points, it, it looked full screen to me after I thought you put display settings initially. I think the issue we're having is is that I can't simultaneously put it up on the big screen correctly and show it to you correctly. So at this uh, point, okay. I, I think we're, yeah, that was I think what was biting us there. So we're just going to go with mm -hmm. this and. Um, oh yeah, well that looks good. Okay. All right, folks. I apologize for the minor delay. <laughs> Interesting that we have the Zoom share screen up there. Um, just as a bit of a reminder for everybody, because I know this has been a bit of a blur, was on the fourth is when we made it. That, the declaration for an emergency in the city of Capitola, and we also issued an evacuation order that afternoon for the lower village due to the storm that was forecasted for the next day. On the 5th is when we got hit. Thankfully, the rain event was anticipated that night and that day didn't really come to pass at that point, but the swell did, and the swell did significant damage to the city. Uh, city Council, we held a special meeting the next day. City Council ratified the emergency order. And then again on the 7th, uh, we began preparing for additional rain from the significant rain event that was forecast for the 8th. We ordered a crane, it was stationed on the bridge, closed during the day, through traffic, and we also ordered an evacuation that morning in the capital of the village in coordination with the county EOC. Um, we had our emergency shelter open whenever we had the evacuation orders in place. And then on the 10th, uh, we got visited by Gavin Newsom. Um, this is the evacuation zone. I think everybody is aware it was focused on the sort of the lower Riverview section as well as the village. What we have done overall <coughs> in the storm since the last update is we obviously had the visit from the governor. Uh, we saw the president declare a FEMA emergency as well. We've been tracking expenses and employee hours, hoping. hoping thinking, planning on reimbursement of FEMA and Cal OES. We've been coordinating with the county, the County Office of Emergency Services, as well as Cal OES uh, to submit our initial estimate of expenditures and costs related to the emergency. In addition, we filed the claim with our insurance carrier for property damages. The next item, we covered by each staff member can kind of go through with what they've been working on. Nikki, you're up. Right. Good evening again, Mayor Council members. Um, so to report on the shelter, um, as you know, we established the shelter um, in coordination with the county to provide mutual aid for the second round of the storms. Um, as of this morning, we had three attendees that have been the same three attendees that we've had all week. Um, and, and we had worked out an agreement with the county that they were providing our um, overnight staffing and then the city has been doing staffing during the day. Um, in uh, my regular check-in this morning with the county EOC, we had a conversation around the um, available resources that and other shelters, and um, are were very aware from the beginning that the Capitola shelter was never really set up to be a long-term shelter. It was always uh, temporary, and so needed to find better long-term accommodations for the three attendees. Um, and so with that and communicating with them, we've identified that they chose um, to go ahead and elect to relocate to the fairgrounds. And as of noon today, um, posted that the shelter had its 24-hour notice and that we will be closing it as of noon tomorrow. Um, there's still a lot of materials that are the counties that will be remaining in the shelter for a couple of days until um, the county is able to coordinate a uh, pickup of those materials. Is there another slide? Thanks. Um, well, I've also uh, been working on volunteer coordination, um, and it has been out now for 
almost a week that we are interested in knowing contact information for any individuals that would like to be part of a volunteer initiative in order to help those that have been affected by this disaster, particularly the village. And um, so far, we have uh, approximately 130 individuals that have emailed or called in and some of those individuals also identify that they are part of a small group of individuals, um, so that's probably a much larger number. Um, staff is, at the moment, considering maybe the weekend of January 20th, however, um, there is a conflict with the tides. So trying to identify um, a date um, still proves a little challenging because we want to make sure that whatever we do um, does its purpose and provides um, support and healing for the individuals in a safe environment that um, is more of community building. So we are, um, staff is looking out, looking, looking towards some community partners that might be able to um, help in the coordination of this and council can expect more information on that. Hi, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. I'm here to just provide a little overview of kind of what the police department did over the last uh, week or so. Um, when the evacuation orders were finally issued, um, we, our staff was, was ready to go out and put the notices out. We, we did make personal contact with all the, the residents and businesses that were evacuated. So we had a team of officers go out and begin a systematical um, check-in and check. They would check with each person, get a name, phone number, if they were going to, what their plans were, if they're going to stay, if they weren't going to stay. Um, and we worked through, like I said, within a matter of uh, just an hour and a half or so, about 400 uh, addresses. Um, and we did that when the evacuation order went into place. Then we had the weather event, um, and at that point uh, there was some destruction. So we basically provided security, kept the public back, and then maintained that security to allow our public works crew in there to do the cleanup that they needed to. And so most of that fencing has been removed. There is still an area that's contained. Uh, we continue, it, when we were in an evacuation uh, zone, we had uh, security that was out there. Uh, we continue to patrol it um, as we kind of ramp up or ramp down. We just uh, assess the needs there. If we do an order, we would bring in the security as well. And then we also stand up our evacuation center. Um, <clears throat> we've also been coordinating with the businesses and residents that have been impacted, just trying to get them the information and provide that conduit between the city and, and, uh, and, the, and the community. And again, we're just continuing to provide security. We do, when, when we were really active during the event, we actually had a staff member that was up at the EOC that was providing information to us in our local EOC here. Um, and so as we're doing that now, we can do a little bit the rem remotely now, so we're able to tune into those uh, weekly, or it's, it's daily updates. They kind of, as, like I said, we're in a, a, a phase right now where they've kind of ratcheted down, but as we see this next event that's coming tomorrow, we have another one, we'll kind of, uh, we kind of wrap back up our, our, our efforts there. So we'll, again, as we look at this, we, we're just adjusting, we're going to have a high tide tonight. Um, we're just continuing to monitor it. Like I said, if we do start doing evacuation orders, we just have things in place where we'll put someone up to the EOC, we'll do our um, evacuation notices, stand up our, our, uh, our center. So that's where we're at. Like I said, um, I think the city manager said we're not through this. Uh, we still have a couple more events that we're, taking my, uh, we're keeping an eye on right now. So we're continually monitoring it, and we're, um, we're here for the community. So thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Uh, to reiterate what the City Manager and Chief Downey said, we are not over this. Uh, we are expecting a high tide early this morning and high surf um, for the weekend, and so we are very much still on high alert over in Public Works. Um, current actions that we have beyond just our regular storm drain cleaning and monitoring is um, we have fenced off the Esplanade uh, to through traffic. Um, so we have the fence protection for the businesses to do the work that they need to do. We've provided dumpsters for them to do the work that they need to do and still have public uh, pedestrian access to the area. Um, we're actively monitoring debris both in the creek and in our other waterways. Um, we're removing potential obstructions. Um, you probably saw the crane that we had out on the Stockton Bridge to remove some of those uh, obstructions earlier this week. Um, our crew very impressively cleaned up a lot of the debris in the village. It was ready to reopen within a day and a half. 
um, to get our residents and our businesses, the ones who were able to enter the residents and businesses back in there. I'm very proud of our crew and the work they've been doing. Um, we continue to monitor erosion, particularly on Cliff Drive and Depot Hill. We have a couple areas uh, that are blocked off so the public can't get to them. I frankly would expect more erosion over our next few storm events and so actively monitor monitoring that situation. Our uh, Riverview pathway was severely damaged and remains closed and will remain closed for quite some time. And uh, like I said, there's been a lot of down trees, down power lines, PG&E has been really impacted and kind of slow to get out to everyone. And so our crews can't get in to remove trees and open up roads till PG&E tells us we're all safe. So I would expect that to continue with the ground saturation and the storms we're expecting in the near future. Um, as far as the known damages we have so far, there's quite a bit um, beyond just our, obviously, our poor, poor wharf. Um, we have damage to quite a few other municipal facilities. Um, these are really, really rough estimates. This is what was provided to Cal OES via the county. Um, I would expect these to go up as they are further assessed and we get kind of more detail of what's going on with those, but it will definitely be in the over $2 million worth of damages to our facilities, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, particularly um, on any of these items. Thanks. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm um, going to report out on the building department. Uh, our, our building um, inspector and our building official have been extremely busy working with all of the businesses along the Esplanade as well as homeowners throughout the Venetian and on the second stories of the Esplanade. Um, we've been making a lot of progress. I want to thank PG&E actually for all of their... Today when I went through the village I felt like every fifth parking space had a PG&E truck in it. So they've been working diligently out there and the coordination efforts between our building official and PG&E, especially TJ Welch, has been amazing. So um, over the past two days we've really been focused on electrical, getting electrical back on the grid, and then today that transferred into gas, so um, doing testing to ensure the gas lines, pressure testing to ensure gas lines are safe before they are um, allowed to have gas back into, the, into each structure. So we've continued to work after the direction you gave us last Friday of no cost inspections and no cost building reviews. We've put that into place. We're also doing um, emergency work. So when for the for um, any testing or um, the inspections that are happening on site right now, we're not requiring that they come to the front desk and get their permit ahead of time when they're ready for an inspection. We'll take in their permit at that time. So we're allowing emergency work without getting permits ahead of time as long as there's communication and Robin Woodman and our building official and Eric Martin have been amazing and on the ground working with all of the business owners and residents. Um, also this yesterday um, I attended a countywide business assistant meeting, assistance meeting that was actually an aftermath of COVID where we're going like, to report back and, like, following up on COVID and then we said, well, it's time for us all, everyone was back on that call and uh, talking about next steps. Also in our BIA meeting, just hearing that the businesses want the messaging out there that a significant portion of the, of the um, the village is open, so we talked about that at our regional, at our countywide business meeting, and as soon as we get past these next two storms, everyone's going to make sure to update their messaging to get that, get that out there for the county. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of numbers, um, right now for residential structures, we have 15 yellow tags. We actually had to add three new ones to Cliff Drive yesterday because of erosion issues with a few homes there and one active red tag at the Venetian. Um, all of those mean that they're not allowed to um, occupy the residence, but yellow tags, you can go in and do a, a certain amount of work, whatever's specified on your yellow placard. And then for commercial structures, we started off with I think it was four red and six yellow. Now they're all in yellow status. Everyone's allowed to do work and they continue uh, to, to go through the process. So we've made great progress with electric. We're now focused on gas. There has been, um, there's some larger impacts to sewer that we're hearing about, but the plumbers are working on gas, sewer, and water in, co in combination. So um, we are going to, 
do emergency permits for sewer, allow them to do the work, and then we'll inspect the work once it's installed. So that's that's progressing in, in movement. So that's my update. And I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any council questions for anybody? I have some. I'll go after you then. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <clears throat> um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, has the evacuation zone changed at all at this point? Should we have to evacuate again? So currently we're in, still in a warning with the, so we work with the county, they have a, the, the program that's called Zone Haven and the mm -hmm. city's broken up into four basically zones. They're very broad and so unfortunately um, it's, the, it's the best messaging that we have right now. So the current, it's still in a warning zone right now. So we're not in a, an evacuation order or anything like that. It's still in a warning just with these upcoming events. So that's, that's the current status that we're at right now. So the E029, the village, is still under evacuation warning, warning. at this point. Right. And um, have, are we sharing any of our resources at this point with any other cities or across the county to Paco um, or anyone, anything like that? I know that we're, like I said, we're embedded in the EOC, so we haven't been asked for any resources. The only resources that we at, were asked for were, was to stand up our, our, our shelter as a regional resource. And so <laughs> that's, that's the current. Um, Great. That's it. Thank you. Are we going to see the crane come back after this <laughs> coming <laughs> storm? Is there any talk? At this point, I think we need to evaluate how effective we think it was. And then in addition, I think we just want to keep an eye on the forecast. I mean, I, you know, it'll come down to a day where we see five inches of rain in the forecast and the hills are saturated. I think mm -hmm. you'll see the rain come back. Um, but in lieu of that, we don't have that kind of forecast uh, in the future right now. The surface of what has me worried for a while. Yeah. And, and just for the public's information, when we move into an evacuation order, is that coming from the city or is that coming from the EOC? So evacuation orders in the city are governed by our operation here. Okay, great. Those are all of my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Question. Yeah. Yeah, so there was a mention about um, the expectation that there's going to be additional erosion as we go into the next storm system. And every time I walk past Britannia, I look at the trees behind the Swenson parking lot that are like on the side of a cliff. Mm -hmm. And I'm really concerned that one of those has kind of come down. Have we um, coordinated with Swenson at all to see if they're still allowing people to park there? Do we have any control over the safety? Um, you know, would we have any liability, even though that's not technically our property? I'm just, every time I walk by there, I think, how have those trees not come down yet? sort of start, that is private property, um, but we do have a responsibility as being the city to yeah. inspect and identify damage, you know, potentially dangerous conditions. So we can take a look at it and see if we can have somebody uh, evaluate the safety of those trees and see whether or not they're stable. Okay, thank you. I had a question for Nikki, I don't know if she's still here. You don't know, probably have to come all the way. People have uh, told me they tried to leave messages about volunteering and we're unable to do so. I just wanted to address that. Yes, Councilman, but thank you for asking. Um, we, we did have a situation where, because we had been previously on the um, winter break and city offices were closed, there was an away message um, that was set and it had been set to not have voicemails um, be left. And as soon as we made that switch, people were able to leave voicemails and um, the emails were always coming through those. So we had a lot of people that had tried to leave a message at the community center, were not able to leave that message, and then went ahead and emailed that me directly saying I couldn't leave a message. Um, so hopefully we have gotten most of those individuals that were not able and they're on our list. If there is anybody else out there or anyone that you know of, I encourage you to go ahead and or have them send me an email. We would love to add them to our list. Thank you, Nikki. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. Uh, have we been able to uh, do any preliminary inspections on the wharf? This 
again. Uh, so the wharf currently is inaccessible. <laughs> um, we have had drone footage, of very good drone footage from some volunteers for the wharf and have had our wharf consultant who had been working on our greater project for improvements examine those videos. Um, we do have them coming out next week. So we will have the professionals to evaluate the wharf during low tide next week, but we have done some preliminary, um, which is where that estimate has come from. That million dollar repair estimate has come from. I think unfortunately tonight the surf is large again with a high surf warning. We're probably yes. going to get more damage tonight. Perhaps. Unfortunately. <laughs> Great. Any more questions? Good. Okay, we can go to public comment if there's any out there. Or any on Zoom. <clears throat> to apply um, for um, your funding? Is that on your website or? It's not yet. We're okay. going to meet with the, um, the Business Improvement District tomorrow morning. Um, I'll have Gail's pastries in hand. Thank you, Gail. Um, <laughs> and we'll talk with um, business owners directly about it and then have some help um, with, from Jerry Jetson and others to help do some door-to-door outreach about that. We think that there is um, far far fewer resources than our people who will want them. So we're not going to do a huge broadcast of the application process right now. We'll just um, go door to door, really truly door to door. Um, and I can send that link to the application if you have business owners that need it. It's just a super simple Google form. It shouldn't take them very long. Great. Well, thank you so much, um, Susan. Your work has 
really helped us out a lot. And I think um, some other council members might have questions or comments. Um, Mayor Kaiser, if I may, I know this is off the cusp and generally we don't speak to our public for questions, but I think this is really important. Um, Susan, can you tell us um, a little bit more? I've seen some information about the flood recovery info sessions. Is that what you were talking about with the, the gales tomorrow at 4? Is that something different? That's what I'm sorry. I just meant um, that was in response to the question about how, how businesses will know how to apply for the okay. business. That's tomorrow morning at the Business Improvement District. The public seminars we have one today at four. Those are hosted by community bridges. There'll be another one tomorrow at four. I'm um, gonna make sure it sounds like you have the flyers about that. Those are hosted by community bridges. They run most of the family resource centers in town and community action board will actually be giving out the direct assistance as well as United you know, policyholders who I mentioned can help residents with insurance claims and eventually FEMA claims when the time comes. So it's gonna be really helpful just to get a sense of like what should I do? How do I sign up to have volunteers help clean the mud out of my driveway? You know, how do I get money because I lost my wages because I was a dishwasher as I was? Like, it should be you know a practical way to get to kind of help people wait fund. And those are again hosted by our, our friends at Community Bridges. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, come on. come back, Mr. Woodside. Thank you very much. Um, just a quick. Uh, question with respect to the river path. I noticed on one of the slides that there's an estimate of damage to the river path. Is that the path that uh, begins right at the um, uh, eastern foot, crossing then on private property, but it's publicly accessible, and then extending all the way up to public property, I think, at the very end? That's what you're referring to. So the question, I guess, is how do the homeowners along the way coordinate so that whatever we do to the path, it comes back in a usable manner? And I suppose we, many of us know who to talk to, but maybe for the general public, we don't all know. So. Great. Thank you. Our public works director can <laughs> push us in the right direction. Um, so any resident on that Riverview pathway can definitely contact me directly um, to coordinate any repairs or fixes because, yes, definitely our intention is to have that whole pathway back open to the public, both the private property side and the public property side. So anyone can directly contact me, and in the coming days we'll be directly contacting the residents, but in the short term we haven't quite had time to get to that just yet. Great. Thank you. Any other public comments? We don't have any other speakers on Zoom there. Okay, great. I can take it to council comments. Okay, yeah, I do. Um, I just wanted to first thank um, Captain Ryan for getting the information out on our social media regarding the evacuations and um, the entire team for really getting the info out to the entire public. I'd really like to see that again happen over the weekend and to continue to notify the rest of council on what's going on and um, generally we see that on our own personal social media but um, it'd be nice to get that information direct from from um, from staff I also really want to say thank you a day and a half of cleanup that is unreal and it is hands down a remarkable um, expression of community and hard work from our city and our staff and I really 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 am so grateful for for all of that work that all of you have done and continue to do I know that you're working 24 hours around the clock um, and answering personal emails and phone calls from not just us from from the community and it doesn't go unnoticed and so I just really want to express my gratitude um, to to all of you here our department heads as well as the staff who are still out there cleaning up preparing for the storms ahead um, and to our public also for non-stop emailing I'm sure all of us about how they can help um, we live in a very special community and um, and I'm just so honored to be part of it. So thank you to, to everyone. Great. Great. Yeah, I'd like to make a comment. I want to say thanks to the city manager, all the staffers, the police department. <clears throat> I got phone calls from people actually all over the world um, just talking about Capitola and how remarkable uh, we, we all came together. And uh, just being the newcomer, it's really great to see. I'm glad to be part of it. Thank you. 
Thank you. I'll just echo the thanks again to uh, city staff and, and all the volunteers and our community members. Um, and again, specifically to the city manager, I think I've probably called or texted like, what, four times a day since the storm? And I imagine everyone else up here probably the same. So uh, thank you for being responsive uh, to us as we attempt to be responsive to the community uh, in addition to all of your responsiveness to the community. And really, that goes for all of you. And um, thank you so much. Great. Alexander, do you have any comments? Um, nothing that hasn't just been said by all the rest of you. It's just been um, an in awe of uh, how great the community was able to come together and really um, look out for each other and the response of the city was just amazing to see. So I think it's just it's a wonderful thing to see you know, these you know, friendly times. Uh, how powerful our community really is. Yes, definitely. And I will obviously be behind all of those comments as well. Um, I think that um, we need to stay strong too, so make sure everybody is <laughs> being nourished. I know a lot of local restaurants and things have fed a lot of our workers and that um, any more support in that way is going to be huge, um, especially as we move forward um, with some impending weather. So hopefully um, we can stay strong and don't lose faith. And thank you, everybody. It literally takes a village. Um, I don't know if we need a roll call for this. OK, no vote on that. Um, so just again, thanks, everybody. <clears throat> I don't know what's happening in my voice, sorry. We can move on to item 9B, which is the regional bike share contract. <clears throat> the recommended action is to authorize a city manager to execute a five-year professional services agreement with B-Cycle B for the regional bike share program. All right. Give us a second. We're going to try a different technique on the Zoom share. So, we yeah, did it. Good here too. Great job. And it seems like this mic works. Okay. Ooh. Excellent. Okay. Well, I'm really excited to bring this item forward to you tonight. Um, the regional bike share is, has been a long. It's been a long time in the making. So, next slide, please, Jimmy. Oh. <laughs> So um, we've got three documents. Um, we've got a bicycle plan for the city of Capitola, our general plan, and then also our climate action plan. And within all three plans, there is direction to collaborate um, towards bike sharing and more emphasis on sharing. And there's goals towards getting more ridership of bikes in order to decrease our impact on the CO2 emissions. So. The direction is there within, within these guiding documents within the city of Capitola. Next slide, please. A uh, little bit of background. When I was putting together this slide and looking back to when did we really launch this, it was back in 2018. When we first went to city council, it was in the fall of 2018, to ask, should we get involved in bike share? At this time, uh, the city of Santa Cruz had jump bikes had been launched. It was a su successful program, and we got direction from city council to, yes, let's move forward, but let's do it right. Um, so we, from there, we updated our municipal code in order to put in place protections to make sure that um, any um, bike share future um, bike share program come in, and there be one contract with the city of Capitola, and to make sure there was um, direction or guidance on how to park a bike, where bikes can be ridden on what side of the street and who can utilize sidewalks. So we updated our the bicycle rules throughout Capitol in 2019. Then we published an RFP in collaboration with the county. Unfortunately, there were no viable options in terms of a no-cost solution to a no-cost contract for the city. So um, we ended up, and then COVID hit. So at that, at that point, we took a break. In 2021, 
actually later in 2022, a group of us started talking during COVID and uh, discussing the possibility of a few of the entities working together. And then we decided, well, let's reach out to everyone in the county. And um, by 2021, we had a small working group for regional bike share. We published an RFI to get information on what what um, providers could provide in terms of a whole system. And then once we got the findings of the request for information, we published an RFP. Uh, we had quite a few responses to our RFP. We interviewed three groups, and part of that interview was actually riding bikes and getting out there part of our um, homework. And in the end, we selected B-Cycle as the top. Next slide, please. The key components that our regional group was looking for was a bike-only system. There was quite a few that came forward with scooters and bicycles. Um, we wanted a single vendor for the whole region. Um, we were looking at hybrid docked or dockless systems. I know our city council is very interested in docked, but on a regional scale, we were not all aligned on that. Um, uh, also, we wanted it third party owned and operated and to have no cost to the jurisdiction and also that they have a, a local team in order to manage the bicycles. And B-Cycle fits all of these. Next slide, please. This is just an image of the bicycles that they'll be providing for the city, also the docking stations. They have a nice clean look. Um, in terms of the bicycles, they do do some, um, that they, like in Encinitas, they had an art project of the baskets having a certain, they had a contest, I believe, for artwork on the bike. So they, they might be more colorful than this, but this is the actual product that we will be getting. And I, I should mention that Oliver Davis and Brian Conga are on the Zoom call tonight from B-Cycle, and they can answer any questions you have regarding the bicycles. Um, next slide, please. So next, I'm going to go into the contract. So a contract it requires that the city council be approved of the contract. And tonight, we're asking for approval of a five-year agreement with B-Cycle. Um, the system is a docked system. It's region-wide. There'll be 660 e-bikes. And then for every e-bike, they, um, they install two docks, so 1320. In Capitola, we are slated to have a minimum of 50 e-bikes and 100 docks. Um, they, within the contract, there's the option to go up to 2,000 bikes region-wide. So we could end up, if it's very successful in Capitola, getting more bikes. Um, the bikes are accessed through an online app. There's no cost to the jurisdiction. And then after the two, first two years, there was a possibility of revenue share based on how much revenue the B-Cycle is making. Next slide, please. Um, for consumer protections, this was one of my focuses within the contract, was to um, ensure that our consumers are protected. So we have a maximum price increase limits. For the first two years, they cannot increase the price. Um, after the first two years, there's an allowance for up to 10% per contract year, or 3% plus CPI, whichever is less. Also, uh, there are maintenance and repair standards within the contract, customer service, response times, um, standards for making sure bikes are available to customers, uh, requirements for safety and education to, um, for consumers, and then also performance standards for the individual bicycles. Uh, the cost associated with this, uh, one of the reasons why we chose B-Cycle was because the, the costs were very, um, very much better than the other uh, proposals. The walk-up pass is $7 per each 30 minutes, so this is a person that um, does not have a, a monthly or annual pass. It's just $7 per 30 minutes with a daily maximum of $75. Monthly, you can get a pass for $30 for unlimited 30-minute trips. And then if you go over the 30 minutes, it's an extra $3 per 30 minutes. And then an annual pass for $150 with that same extra $3 for any time over the 30 minutes. And then there's bulk member pricing programs for low-income students. I know um, UCSC has been working with B-Cycle, and they're, uh, they're working on getting better pricing for their students, but they're also uh, putting money towards the program the university is in order to decrease that pricing for students. Next slide, please. Uh, the timing here, 
um, B-Cycle, when we first interviewed them and throughout the process, has said, we like to make sure our system is installed right and we like make sure that all of our docks are in the correct, correct location. So it does take time as they study where the bikes are being taken from and deposited. So the first rollout is for UCSC and the city of Santa Cruz within six months and then the rest of uh, the region for Capitola, Watsonville, Cabrillo College and the county of Santa Cruz will be within 18 months. So we're we're looking uh, towards 2024, about early or throughout the summer. Next slide, please. Oh, next slide. And then, oh, back one, sorry. So in terms of next steps, I'll be coming back to you. We've been doing some work with B-Cycle um, internally, looking at locations for docking stations. So they're going to be within our right-of-way, and we're just looking for areas um, that will work with them. So Oliver is on the call, and he plans on coming out in the near future to help us with location. So this is just our at first our first look at locations, but we'll be fine tuning this and getting it back to the city council for approval. And then any uh, larger, if they have any signs or anything like that, like that, that would go to planning commission. Next slide. So tonight I'm asking for you to authorize the city manager to execute a five-year professional service agreement with B-Cycle for the regional bike share program. And with that, I'm available for questions. And as I said, Oliver Davis is on the Zoom call with us and Brian Conger, both with B-Cycle. Thank you. Any council questions? Yes. Um, Katie, is this, what happened to the county-wide effort to have all the same, is this the same this thing? This is. Okay, yeah. so the, in the report where it shows all the different information, that's this company and everyone, all the other cities got it. Yeah. Um, so who has, in the contract, does it authorize, or does it say who's authorized to say we can remove a dock? Is that under our purview, like if we have issues with the location after a year or so and we start getting complaints about it, or is that up to the vendor? So we would be issuing uh, revocable encroachment permits, so it would be through our normal revocable encroachment permit process in which the permit itself is revocable, so if there were issues, we could work with B-Cycle to modify where the location is. And can you tell me a little bit about the, the process to complain to give feedback if oh. there were, you know, is that coming to the city or is that going straight to the vendor? How do we, how would we approach that? The complaints would go straight to the vendor. So I'm, but I'm sure as city staff, we will be getting phone calls as well. Um, but there'll be phone numbers on the bicycles and on the um, docking stations informing the public of how they can contact B-Cycle to put in a complaint, and then they'll report out to us and let us know of issues. And also the public is welcome to, of course, reach out to our city staff and let us know if there's any issues. Can you tell me a little bit about the dump being, you know, a bike is dumped in a, in a spot and staff gets a call, so that our public, public works generally is more easily April easily, more easily to get a hold of them versus sometimes a vendor. Can you tell me about how you, I'm sure you talked about it, so. If you sure. Um, well, one reason why we selected B-Cycle is because the bicycle has to be docked at the end of the ride and it has to, be, it has to be parked in one of their docking stations. So if someone were to rent a bicycle and leave it somewhere, they would be paying a really large fee to B-Cycle. So, um, and they'll also get notifications on their phone. I can let uh, Oliver probably speak to this, but I think the, the rider would get notifications that you have to return the bike to a dock. So um, the, the beauty of this system is that they do have to be docked. If they were to leave a bicycle somewhere, um, Oliver, could you explain what would happen there? Yeah, so, so first of all, our intention would never be to try to uh, charge someone the full price of the bike without actually going through the steps of reaching out to them and trying to get the bike back. That's really what our, would be our only focus is can we get our bike back? If so, we don't, we're not in the business of trying to charge anybody for the full price of the bike. Um, with that said, there are, there's going to be times where people leave bikes um, in, in places that affect like you, you, you mentioned there, public works. Um, we will have uh, a fully 
staff team that is able to field those calls, take care of it themselves. Um, if and, and we we'll have we we'll have ways, and we're even, we're working with uh, several jurisdictions on kind of what the outline is right now for people to reach our team directly, and so that we can go take care of that. Um, but yeah, like Katie said, it's there, there are ways of if you don't dock the buck, if you don't dock your bike, we we do within a, a certain period reach out to whoever left it. Um, there are also we we'll use some sort of, we don't have active GPS necessarily on the bikes, but we do have um, some tracking devices where we can find where bikes are lost and, and ping them and try to come back. Oliver, you, you just mentioned um, having staff available. Do you have a, do you have staff a bit here in Santa Cruz County available at this time? Um, uh, Good question. We, so we, we actually were um, just finalizing our agreements. Um, that kind of gives us the go-ahead to um, the higher staff. We're, we're, we're hoping to extend an offer, um, our first offer, to the general manager that previously was working for the, the jump system. Um, so we're, we're looking at doing that really quickly. But we will have uh, a four staff team ready. So yes, to answer your question. So this question's for Katie. Before we enter an agreement, um, Oliver mentioned that they're still working out some kinks in terms of process for picking up and things like that. Have you discussed that with with the team on um, on agreeing on something that's you know that they're not quite ready for? But if we were to approve this evening and they're not quite all set up, do we have maybe a timeline or should we wait? Have you guys met, talked about this at all? So I think we're in a really good position where we'll be in phase two of the rollout. So phase one is UCSC and the city of Santa Cruz. So um, as much as we'd like to have bikes as soon as possible, I think they'll be working out a lot of the logistics of the system while doing the installations with UCSC. They're hoping to have their system in by summer in the city of Santa Cruz. So. By the time we will be entering, um, we'll get our installations in 2024, when they'll definitely have staff, local, they'll have their local staff in place. That is part of the contract that they have the local staff in place in a local warehouse. Um, so okay. I feel confident by the time we're into phase two, all the kinks will be worked out. Mayor, this is my last question, thank you. Um, so why would we enter then into a five-year contract um, now rather than waiting to see have you why why such a long contract oh um well basically we're kind of, we're, we're a smaller city and it's we want to be involved in this contract and by joining it now we definitely have a seat at the table um i think i I would accurately be speaking for B Cycle and saying that the majority of their profits they expect at UCSC, City of Santa Cruz, where there's a much bigger population, but they're willing to do this regional contract where those bikes disperse throughout the region. And we all, I think, we all realize that um, that we want to be involved, and this is the time to be to to be signing the contracts so that we're all in this together. So with our partners who have. Mayor Kaiser, I'm so sorry. As a follow up, then um, this is for our, for Samantha. Is there a clause in the contract for a way out should things go sideways in a year or by 2024 if we learn something that doesn't go well with UC Santa Cruz or um, if we were to approve this this evening? Oh, um, yeah. Thank you. And I guess I'll add without penalty, or what is the penalty? I, I'm looking at the contract now. All of the attorneys for all of the agencies met multiple times about this contract. So I, it's been a while since we did that. So give me just a second. I, it, yes, there's a termination clause here. Um, yes. So the answer is yes. There's a termination clause. It allows us um, to terminate after a 90-day notice asking to cure the issue that's <laughs> leading to the termination. Without penalty or with penalty? Give me just a second. I cannot imagine there's a penalty because we're not paying anything for the contract, but give me just a second. 
I don't believe there's a penalty. And there's also, uh, sorry to interrupt. It's after the second year. It's uh, a nine-day notice of termination of the, of the contract. That's right. After the second year, we give 90 days notice of termination. Um, and I don't see a penalty in here. <coughs> no, we can terminate for convenience, which means basically any reason. Great. Thank you. I have just a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, first is cost. It, it seems like for students or younger people that don't have bicycles or whatever, the cost seems a little bit high. Um, and for tourists, I'm sure they'll, they'll be used by the tourists here. But uh, the cost is, a, is an issue. And also, where are we going to put the docking stations? If uh, you know, there's a nuisance and the, the businesses don't like the location of them, how easy is it for us to move the docking stations? And uh, how long will we be able to work on uh, finding those locations for the docking stations. So first, for cost, um, within the contract, there's a requirement that they um, they work towards creating a program for low income, so at a lower cost. Also, special pricing for students. So that we did agree on. And, and in the past, I think they've worked with libraries to create special cards for undocumented folks or people without phones to be able to access the bicycles. So um, it's, I think they, they've had some good partnerships with libraries to make that special cost, put them in place so everyone has access. Um, in terms of the docking, lo the locations, that will be coming to the city council. So I will be bringing you um, a large a map of where we, and working very closely with our public works director and, and staff um, to identify locations and also work with Oliver. He knows what B-Cycle needs in terms of making, of locating a successful station. So there'll be a lot of work done up front to make sure we're not placing them where they don't belong. Um, and there was initial review back when we were considering going into contract with JUMP back in 2019 on this. So we've done some preliminary work on it, but now once we have a contract, we'll really be getting into the finer details. Um, JUMP, another reason uh, we're impressed by their product is because of the way they can tie into different surfaces. So in areas that we might have pavers, they have a special way to tie into pavers. Where they have asphalt, there's a different treatment for asphalt. So and there, maybe uh, Oliver or Brian, if you could talk about if you did have to remove um, a docking station, what does that take? How often does this come up? And how do you react? to those requests. Oh, Brian, you um, might be muted. I, I can I can answer that though. Um, so <laughs> first first uh, regarding the removal of docks, um, we we designed it to actually be really easy to install and really easy to take out. They're they're less than uh, inch holes that we're drilling in for each dock. Um, but so they are really easy to uh, take in and to remove. It takes us usually less than 30 minutes to install a station. Um, they are individual docks that are driven usually to concrete, and we can also do things on asphalt and on base plates. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, anytime we, if there is a, a need to remove a station, we're, we're used to doing that. That's, that's, uh, that's not a problem for us. Um, just in terms of cost, you kind of alluded to that as well. Um, in, before we, we kind of we operate in Santa Barbara as well, so we're trying to pull up some statistics just to be able to kind of share what what costs um, in Santa Barbara looked like for us in the past year. Um, so we look at the the cost structure is the same in Santa Barbara that we're using in Santa Cruz. That's why I bring it up. Um, but we looked at annual numbers along with uh, monthly numbers and. Um, like I said, the cost structure was the same. The, the annual and monthly numbers, they account for 72% of all rides um, in that system in 2022. And the average cost per trip was actually only, it was uh, $2.80. So per trip, it was uh, a lot more cost effective than kind of what you saw with like the walk up pass where it's $7 per 30 minutes. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, then we can go to public comment. If there's any members of the public? Sorry, I have or, a Oh, sorry. You're all the way over there. Yeah. <laughs> um, for uh, Oliver, um, are you planning or um, have you worked with uh, businesses to put docks on private property as well? Because um, it seems to me that one of the major uses of a bike share program would be going to different businesses for work or for shopping. Um, and specifically, I know there's a, a lot of bikes around the Dapolo Mall on the 41st Avenue Corridor, which I think would be a really useful um, option for this type of service. Yeah, that's a great question. We, um, we, we definitely do it, and that's our goal and our plan. Um, it's each individual station, or each, each time we have to work with a, a private individual on stations, we have to do the contracting all individually, right? So if we, if we were to work with 10 different private entities um, for 10 different stations in Capitol, for example, those are 10 different contracts, whereas if we work just with the city right away uh, up front, we can get a whole lot of stations, for, or a whole lot of options for stations. Um, so that's what, that's what we're doing right now, Katie, is trying to figure out where stations can go and, and fill in the gaps with private companies, and that's our intention. Um, let's see. Oh, um, yeah, I have a handful of questions here for you. And I'd like to just say I'm really excited about this program. Uh, long time coming for a uh, bike share program in this area. It's a great service. Uh, I also did have um, concerns about the uh, $7 per 30 minute. Um, I hope that we can find a way to um, mitigate those prices for low income, especially those who may not have the uh, ability to pay the $30 or $150 for a subscription to access those cheaper prices. And I was curious, do you have any um, ideas about uh, how much the low income pricing might be or, or what that might look like? So I believe in our contract, it's, it says that we have to work that out. Um, I, I don't have it. We don't have that prepared today. I don't see you might have made an um, agreement like that um, in another city at this time. Is my audio working yet or no? Yes. Yeah, so right. Great. Great. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, sorry, sorry for that. Um, in Santa Barbara, which is at least for much the pricing structure that we outlined for Santa Cruz, we have the same structure. We do have a low income pass in the Santa Barbara market. Um, that's a twenty-five dollar uh, pass for unlimited sixty-minute trips. Um, we can open. I mean, that's just a, a, an example of one that's in uh, you know market kind of similar in terms of just how we face the program. So I think that could be something that we would be you know it's just a starting point. Something that we do currently in a very similar market. Um, I believe Katie referenced our partnership with libraries on um, the market. So in our Madison Wisconsin program, which is where Elmer has kind of our own system, uh, and also in our Nashville system, we partner with the library branches, um, which basically it, it involves we have an RFID card, which anybody can go in and check out with their library card, and that RFID card is what allows them to access the system. So they don't need to have a credit card, they don't actually even need to sign up. Um, it's just a system that we have put in place in partnership with the libraries um, to provide basically very low barrier access. We also love that partnership because it is oftentimes a communication needs on people go to the library for information and it's a trusted source of information. So um, for us, that's a great community partner to work with um, so that people who will oftentimes have questions um, can go in and get information and have access to a computer to learn more about the program. Um, but then also directly get a free pass on the least in the partnerships that we've um, set up in similar markets we operate. Um, okay, and uh, have you worked with um, any businesses to offer a full pricing for employees or any discounts? Or yeah, that's, that's something to do work. Yeah, we do, yeah, do have programs similar to that. Um, a lot of that comes down to, um, you know, our work with the general manager that will be hiring, um, they would be, that would be within their purview to really be the point person for interested businesses. Um, and like I mentioned, Santa Barbara is a similar program. We have um, 
uh, business SaaS options um, there, um, and, and those are really oftentimes more brokered on a um, business by business basis uh, through, through contacts with our local lead manager of the program. Great, I just have one uh, last question for you and then another question for staff. Um, I'm assuming I haven't seen uh, none of the other bike share program. You won't be offered an helmet, is that right? So we do not have uh, an automated way to you know, provide a helmet, um, at least when people are walking out to rent. We do strongly encourage reduces helmets. Um, right. uh, we're a parent, our parent companies, we are owned directly by Trek Bicycle. Um, so Trek is the manufacturer of the bikes, and they obviously, if, if people are familiar with that um, company, we, we have bike shops, retailers in the area, so um, in other markets, oftentimes what we also do is encourage helmet uses, partnering with local retailers, directing people where they can purchase helmets um, and, and in some cases giving helmets away as promo kind of items and events. So um, that's just something that we really believe in from a safety perspective. Um, and, and, and that would be really important to um, have some public outreach on the of uh, being cycle and the city to encourage people to wear helmets and riding bicycles. Council member Peterson, um, I just wanted to let you know that they also, they have a, they're working with Ecology Action, so they, they're partnering with them in terms of safety and getting the, you know, to, for safe practices in bicycle riding. So that, that was put together as part of the RFP and proposal, part of the proposal. So that's exciting for us to, you know, they've got local feet on the ground with safety measures. Thank you. And um, you know, my last question was, um, I was curious if uh, all the cities and the county are also engaging in a five-year contract with eCycle, or if that number of years was you need to back to that. That is the standard uh, PSA agreement, so there's been kind of a joint uh, negotiation effort, which is kind of across the jurisdictions. So right now, all of the um, jurisdictions are working off of the same model public uh, professional services agreement, which is the one um, that you that we have had access to. There might be some very, very slight modifications to some of just, you know, we're trying to keep it consistent wherever we can, um, but, you know, the intention is that the, the vast majority of the agreements will be the same across markets, including the term. Great, thank you. Thank you. Did we have any public comment? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm also very excited that we might have the bike share program, although it sounds like a long way for us, 2024. I have uh, three questions, and I'm just going to tell you all three questions, and then you can answer them. Um, one of them is, do you have some statistics, statistics about the uh, length of trips? Are, the, are, are trips typically 30 minutes, or are they 45 minutes? So more common that they might go over that 30-minute threshold. Um, but 
Having to follow up with more detail, um, summary of that would be helpful. Your second question, I believe, was about the age restriction. And I apologize, I want to say that our standard is uh, it somewhat varies based on the system that we're um, supporting, but uh, 18 years is our typical um, requirement for somebody to rent a bike. Um, because there's a user agreement that they would have to sign off for. Um, so that's at least for the, the age requirement for somebody to go through our user agreement. If somebody's under that age, they could have um, their guardian sign off on that on their behalf, um, which could allow them to be younger. Um, but at least our standard is that 18 would be the age you need to uh, sign off on the user agreement. If you do that, I mean, the third question was if you would get a flat tire while you're riding. Um, we do design bikes in a way that we try and mitigate that as much as we can. We use a very kind of thick tire wall um, to be um, resistant to more like pressure flats. And we do have crews that go out and regularly maintain the bikes. Um, but it is something that can happen, does happen um, over the thousands of trips we'll be generating. Um, if that were to happen while you were on your ride, um, the simplest thing to do would be is if you're near a station, if you can return it to a station, um, and, and notify us, we would be certainly able to kind of adjust your trip, um, give a refund in that instance. Um, if it's not possible to get a bike back to the station because of the flat, um, we are planning on bikes for uh, Santa Cruz to be equipped with a secondary cable lock, um, which would be intended to use for short term you know, convenience to, um, to temporarily secure the bike. So, another option would be to uh, secure the bike using the secondary cable lock in a traditional bike rack call in or text our customer service support line um, and then just instruct them on where you left the bike and we can have our in city crew pick that bike up and, and adjust it. Great, thank you so much. Any other, yeah, Mr. Wilk. Hi, Peter Wilk here. I, I'm glad you're allowing questions because I don't have a comment, I have a question and it, it, it's along the lines of the helmet. Mm -hmm. So I can envision doing, wanting to rent this spontaneously, right? So you're saying, oh yeah, let's just get out of here, grab a bike, but I'm not gonna have a helmet with me. So the question is, what is the law on helmet requirements? Uh, it's a heavy motorcycle helmet because it's an electric bike. You know, what, and uh, what is the fine if I get busted by driving one of these things without a helmet? So I guess that's a question more for the police department, but I'd like to have a sense of when I can use these and when I can't, especially if I don't have a helmet. Thank you. Yeah, we'll have, we'll have Chief respond. <clears throat> Thank you. So I know, you know, helmets are required for anyone that's under 18. Uh, adults, it's a recommendation. Um, there is a couple things. I believe that the, there is a muni code that you cannot actually issue a citation. So we have a muni code violation, and the, the vehicle code also has a violation for, like, again, those that are underage. Um, but clearly, bicycle uh, helmets required if they're underage. Great. Thank you so much. Are there any other public comments? There are no further speakers on the same here. Thank you. We can go to council comments or a motion. I have another comment. Yes. Um, probably not the question, but uh, I just want to say it would be very nice if the app had a single button you could to report a mechanical issue with the bike rather than having to call or text the organization, which in my experience is always very tedious. We do, that's great feedback. We do not have like a single button push to report an issue, but in that you can access a report an issue. Um, okay. There might be a couple clicks involved, um, but it's, right. it's more support thing, so you don't necessarily need to get a live agent to take care of it. You can report it, pass it on, and then um, that channel gets monitored by your local um, technician team. Perfect, thank you. Any other comments? Um, I'm, I'm prepared to make a motion. Um, I, I want to stress that we continue, though, to look at ensuring that because if there's use of underage and whether it's in I'm going to get the right B cycles language or our language if an under someone of underage is utilizing the bike and what our safety precautions are for helmets that's above me and whether we need to adjust our muni code to say that it's inclusive of a you know for these e bikes or whatever it may be I I, I want us to I want to make sure that we address that um, but while moving forward with uh, 
authorizing the city manager to execute a five-year professional service agreement with B-Cycle for the regional bike share program. And that's my motion. Thank you. Second. Seconded by Councilmember Peterson. Can we have a roll call, please? Council Member Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser? Aye. It passes unanimously. <clears throat> And we had item 9C removed from the agenda this evening, so we'll be moving on to 9D, which is the City Council appointments to City Advisory Bodies. The recommended action is to appoint City Council representatives to remain to remaining county and regional boards and support, a, oh my god, I can't read, and appoint members to, of the public to the City of Capitola Advisory Bodies. <laughs> Do we have uh, 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 I don't know what happened. <laughs> Thanks for hanging on. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I just want to verify that um, Council Member Peterson, can you see the screen okay? Yes, I can. Thank you. Great. Well, we are back here again after a brief hiatus from the last meeting to review and make appointments to the City Council representat representatives on county and multi-jurisdictional boards and commissions, as well as make appointments of members of the public to the city's advisory bodies. We previously reviewed the capital representation on these groups on December 8th, and the City Council elected to make appointments to some of the county and multi-jurisdictional boards and commissions, as well as the Planning Commission. Tonight we'll review the remainder of these appointments and as we move through the presentation we will pause to allow time for council deliberation and action. So the City of Capitola is represented on various multi-jurisdictional advisory bodies by members of the City Council. These boards and committees are established by other codes or bylaws. As I mentioned on December 8th the City Council reviewed and made appointments to four of these groups. Tonight for your consideration is approval of representation on at least um, five of these groups. We've also included representation on the Criminal Justice Council. Um, the Criminal Justice Council has a representative that will not expire until 2023. However, the council may elect to change the representation based on review of tonight's meeting. So at this time, I would ask that the council review and make appointments to the first five groups. The next meeting dates are listed on the screen, as well as current representat representatives. Okay, so thank you. Um, Advisory Council of the Area Agent Agency, I think one note I would like to make for this group in particular, I did inquire with the clerk of the board for that group. The representative for the Advisory Council of the Area Agency on Aging does not need to be a council member. It is their recommendation that it continues to be a council member. However, a member of the public can be appointed to represent Capitola on this body. Do we have anyone who is interested? Shock said he might remain. I spoke with council, former council member Bertrand, and he has indicated that if the council would so choose, he would serve. I'm okay with that. Yeah, me too. <clears throat> right. Right. Great. Thank you, Mr. Bertrand. Sanitation. That's a double, double open seat. Correct. This one will require a primary appointment and an alternate appointment. If anyone that wants to take a stab at it. <laughs> okay. Don't jump up. <laughs> okay. Um, how do we how do we go about this if nobody wants to? Well, one suggestion could be you could figure out which ones people want to be on and then you okay. can draw straws for the others. Okay. Okay, so do we wanna table that one until we figure out what other people's interests are? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> All right, the library financing, we've got Council or Vice Mayor Brown, and then we need an alternate. Any interest in an alternate? I would like to be the alternate if, if Vice Mayor Brown. Yeah, that sounds good. 
Thank you, Councilmember Clark. The uh, Integrated Waste Management Task Force Group previously had a staff member as the primary um, representative. That staff member has retired from the City of Capitola. Um, Public Works Director Jessica Khan has been working with the group um, as in the interim, so we recommend that she continue to work with them as the primary. However, a council member is appointed as the alternate member. Okay. And I'm happy to be the alternate And Director, you're okay staying on. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, are we going to fill it in as we go or not? We have the to. screen just, sharing. Okay, it's no going to be challenging for me to switch <laughs> no from problem. in and out, but I will review me. the motion. Okay. At the end, I take your notes. And then the Library Advisory Commission has a. Oh, that's expiring. So the Library Advisory Commission is a citizens' commission. Represent each one of the jurisdictions appoints somebody. Um, Michael Termney is our current appointment. He's indicated he's interested in serving again. Okay, great. And then criminal justice. I've really enjoyed my time on the Criminal Justice Council, but I feel like Councilmember Clark having the expertise and experience in it would better serve. And then Mayor Kaiser, if you don't mind, I would be happy to take over as an alternate. Yeah. I think it's a great idea. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so sanitation. Let me look at that date real quick, if you don't mind. Um, what is the typical uh, meeting cycle? Do we know? I don't know how many a year. I don't know how many a year. You can see the meetings are usually during the late afternoon. And it is, it is comprised of the rest of the Board of Supervisors, I believe, and the Capitol and City Council. What do they do? Uh, oh, sewer and water? Sewer. Well, I'm already on the flood control district. I guess I could join this one, too. <laughs> okay. Sign me up. I'll be your alternate. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> So to recap, for the Advisory Council of the Area Agency on Aging, former Councilmember Bertrand will continue to serve as the appointee for Capitola. For the Sanitation District, as primary member, we have Vice Mayor Brown. As alternate, we have Mayor Kaiser. Uh, for the Library Financing Authority, as our primary member, we'll have Vice Mayor Brown, um, with Councilmember Clark serving as alternate. For the Integrated Waste Management Task Force, we will have Public Works Director Jessica Kahn and um, Alexander Peterson as the alternate. Or Councilmember Peterson as the excuse me. For the Library Advisory Commission, we will continue to have Michael Termini serve as the appointee for Capitola. And for the Criminal Justice Council, we will have Councilmember Clark and Vice Mayor Brown. At this time, staff would recommend a motion to approve these appointments. Great. I'd like to make a motion to pass these. Thank you. I'll second. Great. We have a. Motion second. <laughs> Are you going to say something? No. Oh, okay. I'm absolutely Sorry. not going to say anything. <laughs> we, need, we don't need public comment on this, do we? Yeah, we do. Oh, we do, yeah. So before we go further, why don't we reach out to the public for their comments? There are no speakers on Zoom. Well, before we did that, we had a motion and a second on the table, so why don't we do a roll call? Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. Mayor Kaiser? Aye. That also passes unanimously. That was 9D, which takes us to... Wait, we have more bodies. More bodies? <laughs> oh, no! Uh, not done yet. Oh, I'm really know. rushing things. <laughs> So the next part of this presentation is going to focus on these city's advisory bodies. And so Capitola has established multiple city advisory bodies that assist and advise in formulating policy for the city. Appointments are made depending on bylaws or the municipal code. So previously on December 8th, the city council reviewed and made appointments to the planning commission in accordance with Capitola municipal code. Tonight we'll review the remaining four bodies that need appointments made. Um, the city clerk's office received seven applications for new appointees to these bodies and eight requests for reappointment. These bodies allow members of the public to participate in city government as volunteers, and they are really valuable for feedback and communication between city members of the community and staff. 
The advisory bodies listed on the screen are the ones that currently have vacancies. There is a difference between regularly scheduled vacancies and unscheduled vacancies. Unscheduled vacancies occur when a member of an advisory body quits or leaves their term early, and then regularly scheduled vacancies are when vacancies term out. So each person is appointed for a set term, and then when the term expires, we need to reappoint them or appoint somebody else to fill that position. So as you can see on the screen, there are four bodies with remaining terms that need to be filled. We're going to move through each of these bodies and we will make a motion for each of them in turn. So we'll take pauses in between. The first one is going to be the Arts and Cultural Commission. So as you can see here, we have three members who are seeking reappointment and two members who have resigned. So this leaves two um, vacancies and for those we received one new applicant. So for the Arts and Cultural Commission, staff recommends making four appointments. So bear in mind there are three members who have requested reappointment and there's one person who has requested appointment to this group. All four of these terms will expire in December of 2024 as it's a two-year term. Would you like me to return to the previous? Okay. Please, thank you. Uh, do, you want to, do we need public comment on each of these bodies? City Attorney, City Manager, do we need to take public comment on each of these appointments to each? So like before I make a motion to appoint this person, this person, this person, do we need to go out to public comment? It's going to be the, the microphone by the presentation computer right there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wild night. Uh, so what I would recommend is, um, similar to what you did with the last portion of the presentation, deciding... Every time you take action, a vote, you need to take public comment. So you can... We could just get consensus on who to reappoint, go to the next body, get consensus, and then when we get to the very end, make a motion to approve all the things we just agreed on and then take public comment that's, for the motion. That's one way to do it. That's probably the most efficient approach. Alternatively, you could vote on each body, which would take public, public comment four times. Okay. So it's the mayor can decide, but that's likely the most efficient route. Yeah. Let's go with that route. Great. In that case, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next group, which is the Commission on the Environment. Get feedback on the first one. So yeah, I think, we're, I think we're going to like yeah. say, let's appoint these people. If we all agree, we'll move on, but we won't actually vote until the end. Can we do it that way? Is that in there? That's what I understand. Okay. Can do. Okay. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. So I'd like to suggest moving forward with the three seeking reappointment, as well as Mr. Wilk for this particular um, Arts and Cultural Commission. And that's just my comment before we go out to public comment. It's just my okay. comment. That's okay with me. Okay, great. Everyone, cool. In that case, we will go ahead and move on to the Commission on the Environment. Just and we'll make the motion and the vote at the very end of all four groups. Yes. So for the Commission on the Environment, this is a body that has four people seeking reappointment. It's a two-year term. There's also one new applicant. So there are five, five total applicants for four spots. Staff recommends making four appointments for terms expiring in December of 2024. You have a selection of five people who are um, volunteering to serve on this committee. My comment would be to appoint the Ms. Uh, Meredith Keith, Jason Shepherson, Michelle Birdsoff, and Anthony Lassonier, Lassonier for this particular commission. That's my comment on the Commission on the Environment. Do we know the, do you know the new applicant? I was uh, Anthony would, would be my appointee if, oh, I, okay. if I had it. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is, the, is this a... So wait, in that case, doesn't it just isn't it just Alexander and Joe that get to choose the new appointments? Since Brooks, Brown, and oh, that's it looks like these are based on specific people. Right. So for oh, this group, um, we do have a council representative to this group, and I believe it's um, Mayor Kaiser. So the remaining four members of the council would each get one. Choice. Oh, I see. So so. Alexander, Joe, Yvette, and myself need to choose our own individual. Correct, because okay. your previous appointee's terms expired. Okay. So it's oh, time for a new person. I say, no, I didn't know. Yeah, okay. my apologies. I, my comment would be to move forward with Michelle again, who's seeking reappointment. 
Um, I'd like to overview from Peter Rook. And then, oh. And my appointment would be Anthony. And I'll stick with uh, Jason Shepardson. Thank you. The next group is going to be the Finance Advisory Commission. So for this group, we have two members who are seeking reappointment, and we have three positions that did not apply for reappointment and need to be filled. Um, one of those is Councilmember Peterson's seat, which he vacated when he accepted his position on the City Council. For this group, we received five new applicants, as well as the two who are seeking appointment. So it's a, um, there's an active decision to be made here between all of the seven people who wish to serve. Right, no, I do. yeah. Staff recommends making five appointments to the Finance Advisory Committee. The terms will expire in December of 2024. To recap, you have two people who are seeking reappointment and five people who are seeking appointment. Madam Mayor, so you may recall that the Finance Advisory Committee, in its bylaws, the Mayor and Vice Mayor serve as members of the Finance Advisory Committee, and then the other three members in the Council point to the fact. Yes. Um, but there's language, I believe, that says that if the Mayor and Vice Mayor don't want to serve, other people can step in. So my understanding is, is that Council Member Brown and Council Member Peterson are the Council's representatives. Yeah. So the other three of you then would be able to choose among the applicants to appoint. Thank you. Um, I believe my appointee reapplied, Anthony Robai, so I'll stick with that, please. Can we go back to the name? <laughs> so, I mean, I know I'm not appointing, but... So these are the names of the new applicants. I couldn't get it all to fit on one slide here, but we have the two people who are reapplying and then the five new. I would like to move, um, make my appointment as Michelle Kaufman. Mine was good. Do I steal yours? <laughs> Surprise. Mm -hmm. I have, uh... Can you bounce back to yeah, the... Yeah, can you go back to the three members? members? Yeah, yeah. If, if Laura is seeking a reappointment? She is. Yes. I'd like to have her as my appointee. I don't Great. I think that's that all you need. So, so then there's one other nuance here. I'm sorry. Were you about to? Well, there's two more spots that need to be filled. And those are the business representatives, right? Correct. And who are the applicants for the business representative position? I have to pull up the applications really quickly. Bear with me one moment as I do that. And is that an entire council consensus, or is that still that's just the, the people? That's the full consensus. Well, one of the business reps is seeking reappointment, right? Yeah, maybe I have to switch my... my. Oh, yeah, because you made a mere appointment, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, while, while you're looking that up, I have a question. Do we still have a student rep on finance? Do we have any students apply for finance committee? Or are we going to advertise for that again? We did not receive any student applications from the Finance Advisory Committee, and I don't believe there are any current student Members on the Finance Advisory Committee, there is one. one. Yeah. Is he still there? Yes. Oh, well, there you go. Do they have, they don't have, a, do they have terms on their appointments? <laughs> the students? So they go to college? I don't believe they're voting members. They're ex officio members. Yeah, so, so they can they're not voting, voting members, it's a little bit different. Okay. Good refresher. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so is Michelle a business? Okay, okay. Is it the same um, young man that's been on it for like four years? Yes. Wow, that's impressive. Wow. We have to convince people up here to be on the Finance Advisory Committee, so the fact that he's been there for four years is quite impressive. Oh. No offense, Jim. It wasn't. So, one option would be you may remember that we expanded the number of business representatives recently, this last year, I think it was, on the Finance Advisory Committee. Right. And uh, do you know that Michelle Kauf, I think she's Michelle, not, She's no? not business. No. Okay. If we bounce back to the last slide, we could see who the current business representative was who is seeking reappointment. So it, both of our business representatives are not seeing reappointment because right. one of them was appointed to council, uh, Councilmember 
here said was a business representative, and then um, Alexandra Dale did not uh, apply for reappointment, and she was the other business representative. And that was the newly appointed business representative during the last appointment cycle to the FAC. All right. So we may need to continue recruitment for the business representative. We, in the past, we've worked with the Chamber of Commerce on that one. So should we move? On, on the applications, I can see that the applicants did not specify whether they were business or at large. Of the new applicants, um, Diana Varkatos is a retired member of the community. Enrique Dolmo is um, a member of the community, but he did not indicate if he was a business representative. <laughs> Michelle Kaufman applied as an at-large member. She didn't indicate at-large. Dana Masso Hoost did not indicate whether or not she was a business representative or an at-large member. And Peter Wilk um, is also at-large and indicated such on his application. So it sounds like what we need to do is continue to advertise for business representative and we can reach out to the Chamber of Commerce because I think historically the Chamber of Commerce would nominate an individual for us to appoint. I'm reading Diana's. Okay, yes, sorry. Um, yeah, I think we can we appoint what we already discussed and then go back out for the business representatives? Okay. So that brings us to the last group of the evening, which is the Historical Museum Board. <coughs> the current composition of the board shows that there are two members who resigned creating unscheduled vacancies, and we did receive two applications for this board. <laughs> And the new applicant names are listed on the screen. I say that we appoint the two new people that want to be on the board? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Roger, So to recap the appointments made so far through Council's recommendation, beginning with the Arts and Cultural Commission, we have the reappointment of James Wallace, Kelly Zunder, and Roy Johnson, and the appointment of Peter Wilk. With the Commission on the Environment, we have the reappointment of Michelle Baratoff Law, Peter Wilk, Anthony Wilry, or I'm sorry, Anthony Lassenier, and Jason Shepherdson. And um then for the Finance Advisory Committee, we have the appointment of Anthony Rovai, Michelle Kaufman, and Laura Aliotto. And for the Historical Museum Board, we have the appointment of Enrique Dolmo and Roger Wyant. So at this time, staff recommends making a motion like and taking public, public comment public on these actions. Yes, thank you so much. Do we have public comment? <laughs> Anything there are no speakers on Zoom. Perfect. Council, do we have a... I'll move approval of the uh, recommended appointments to the city advisory bodies. I'll second it. Great. We have a motion and a second. Maybe do roll call, please. Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Oh. Aye. Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser? Aye. That passes unanimously. Do we have anything else? <laughs> Lovely. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for hanging in there this evening. We can go to item 10, which takes us to adjournment. So this meeting is adjourned. Be safe out there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Use it if you got it. You have to call me so and tell her you both were. I, I'll tell her I stole it on accident. I don't need it. Mike's so hot. <laughs> Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So we're just embarrassing ourselves amongst each other now. <laughs>